Hi, I'm Linda Rolfe. I'm the director of the Division of Developmental Disabilities, and I'm presenting this morning the history of the field of developmental disabilities in the state of Washington. And I usually do this with a much more interactive audience with self-advocates and families, and it is uh, where people tell their stories. There's not going to be much of that today, so I'd really appreciate it if you would think about what your introduction to the field of developmental disabilities was when you were uh, first um, interested in the field, whether that was in school when you met a person with a developmental disability, or whether it's just now when you were hired to support uh, people with developmental disabilities. So I'd, I think it would be helpful if you would think about your life experience and what formed your perspective about the field and how you think about people with developmental disabilities as we go through this history because history has a way of influencing perspective and perspective um, influences what people have access to your perspective as a professional influences what you give people who rely on you for support uh, an opportunity to experience so just remember that when you're thinking about the history and as we go through this um, presentation today. The first um, introduction uh, to developmental disabilities was when a man named uh, Samuel Howell in the 1880s looked around and found that a lot of people who were mentally retarded were kept away from their communities. They were generally kept at home, um, in back rooms, and he felt that people could learn, could, um, with the proper sort of schooling, could actually learn and become more productive in their society. So he created, in the 1880s, the first institution for people with developmental disabilities. And that the framework of that institution and the context was that the people who came there would be taught. Um, and that's a really important thing for you to think about because it set up two divergent kinds of ways of thinking about people. One, that they had to be sent somewhere else to learn, and two, that they could learn. And those two concepts have been instrumental in creating the, the uh, framework that we currently operate in the field of developmental disabilities. The first institution in the um, state of Washington was built in 1905 as sort of an annex to the School for the Blind, but the annex was built in uh, Medical Lake Washington, and it eventually became Lakeland Village in 1915. By the 1950s, there were over 4,000 people who lived in institutions in the state of Washington, and that was primarily the only service option for people uh, for those very many years. And over the course of that time, from the 1880s to the 1950s, there were very many hugely uh, negative things that happened to people um, that influenced how people thought about them in the community and why they were willing to send uh, people away. Families were generally given the advice by the, the professionals in their uh, lives to um, let go of that family member, put uh, him or her in an institution, and get back to their families who were, had typical abilities so that they could learn um, and be uh, part of their community. The, um, 1950s and 1960s families rebelled at that advice. Many families rebelled at that advice. Some families had to take it. But many families rebelled and said, no, we want something in the community. We don't want to send um, uh, my son. I don't want to send my son or my daughter to uh, Rainier School or to uh, Lakeland Village. I want to have something in the community for my son or daughter. I want to keep him home. Uh, I want there to be um, something available in the community. In the 1950s and 1960s, also, we had the big scandals about the institutions. So while institutions were built on the basis of the fact that people could learn and could grow and could uh, have the same kinds of experiences, those typical experiences were very hard 
to develop in an institutional environment. They were very hard for people to experience. And if they were able to do it, they were very expensive. Uh, institutions weren't funded properly. And so we had big scandals, huge um, uh, newspaper coverage and media coverage of Willowbrook, which was an institution in um, New York, and Christmas in Purgatory, uh, which showed the lengths to which um, uh, people had, the th kinds of things that people had to experience in that lived in institutions. That did not, those kinds of experiences did not occur in the state of Washington, but they had, did occur in the huge institutions back east. And it framed uh, how people thought about what people needed. And so there were legislators in the state of Washington that decided that uh, to listen to some of the families who were saying, we want community um, options for people. And they said, um, Kay Epton was one of those legislators, and she passed a bill offering up community options for people in, um, in the state. And those community options were supposed to occur with county intervention. Um, she also um, decided that, should, that people should have uh, a group living experience separate from the institutions. So there were two parts to her, to her bill. She established the Epton Centers, which were the developmental centers of that time, and offered an educational experience for those children who could not go to school. Because um, in the 1950s and 1960s, people with developmental disabilities were not many people with developmental disabilities were not allowed to go to school, um, particularly if they were not able to transfer by themselves and not able to uh, feed themselves. They wouldn't be able to go to school. So the Epton Centers were uh, established for children to enable them to have some place to go to learn and to grow. Um, and it also in the 50s and 60s, the great migration from the institutions across the nation, but also in Washington, started. And I'd like uh, Linda to tell you the story um, of her first introduction to um, the field of developmental disabilities, uh, which began in the late 60s. When I was in high school, there was a family that um, attended the church that I went to who had a son with autism. And at that time, one of the treatments for autism was that patterning where they put people on the table and move their limbs back and forth and so it was um, took a lot of, of people to do that and a lot of time and so they got, had volunteers from our church to go and help out and so as a teenager I did that I volunteered and I went and worked with this boy and ended up um, also caring for him and his brother when his parents so his parents could go out and I just remember um, just being really intrigued by him and wanting to get to know him and people like him more. So the 1950s and 1960s were um, hugely influenced by family and friends, with family and friends saying, we want our friends, we want our family members to have experiences in their home communities. Uh, the people um, uh, who uh, lived in the institutions and the people who worked in the institutions at th that time tried really hard to give people important experiences and learning experiences, but it was very difficult with the numbers and very difficult because of the isolation. So the uh, families um, uh, who influenced the 50s and 60s began to build the kinds of um, uh, group living experiences and developmental centers that began in the 1970s. In the 1970s, it was a, um, a huge, it was influenced primarily by professionals because professionals decided that we were uh, not, we were missing the mark related to people learning. Um, in the 1970s, a man by the name of Mark Gold decided that people with very severe disabilities um, severe intellectual challenges, severe physical challenges could learn and if they couldn't learn one way you would try another way. So he taught, um, he was a professor at a university and taught people with very severe disabilities very complex kind of work 
um, moves, assembling the cliche is assembling bicycle brakes, which are which are huge, hugely complicated pieces of machinery and put together by people with very severe, uh, profound intellectual challenges. It was an important uh, accomplishment and taught professionals that people um, with severe disabilities could uh, work. In the 1970s, um, the state of Washington, through the work of three or four uh, parents and a young um, competent lawyer, decided that we needed a bill in the state of Washington that would allow all people with developmental disabilities, all children, to go to school. So in 1972, Washington passed the first uh, Education for All bill in the United States. Uh, the National Education for All bill did not pass until 1974. Congress passed it in 1974, Education for All, 94, 172. And in the 1970s, we brought to the state of Washington uh, a fair number of professionals across the nation to teach us about what people could accomplish, what people could do, and what kind of lives they should have. John and Connie Lyle O'Brien were two of the most important people that we brought, and they've had a profound influence across the 70s, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s, into the new century. Uh, on how we think about what services are for people with developmental disabilities and what they should be. In the mid-70s, we created case services, with, which translated into field services. Um, we also created a family support program, which was originally known as Home Aid. Um, we, we built a fair number of group homes in the 19. Uh, late 1960s and 1970s, but in the mid-1970s to the late 1970s, we realized with the combination of the values training that we were getting, as well as just the physical kinds of structures that were being built, that, hu that uh, large group homes um, were not really a viable long-term answer for housing for people. We just couldn't build them fast enough, license them fast enough. Um, they were so expensive. So we decided that we would um, put together uh, supported living where people would rent their own apartments, their own homes in the field. That was influenced by uh, John Stern at the time. Um, and uh, we started alternative living and um, tenant support programs which eventually became our supported living programs. In the 1980s, that was a time for rebuilding and renewal because one of the things that we find in the field of developmental disabilities, and I'm sure it must be true in other fields as, as well, is the further we get away from typical environments for people with developmental disabilities when we start building, the more likely it will be that sooner or later we'll have to tear those down and build them in more typical frameworks. So in the 1980s, we did a lot of rebuilding and restructuring of our service system, moving from group environments to more individualized kind of env environments. Um, so it's really important that one of the things that you think about as a professional in this field is be careful about what you build because it says something, what you build says something about how you think about people and it also means that if you build it too far away from what's typical, you're going to have to tear it down. And I can't tell you how often I've had to tear things down that I thought were really good ideas at the time. In the 1970s and 80s, we started thinking about values. In the 1980s, we built a series of uh, guidelines for county and residential services based on um, benefits, based on six important benefits for people. Uh, and those benefits I'll talk to you about later, but I'd like Mark Eliason to tell you a little bit about his introduction into the field um, of developmental disabilities and keeping in mind that what you build is really important. Well, my introduction with uh, people with developmental disabilities was uh, at Western State Hospital in the institutions. Um, there were a lot of individuals who were duly diagnosed 
uh, who had behavioral challenges in the community and there was uh, a need to basically protect them from themselves so they were being housed at Western State Hospital. Um, so our goal basically was to provide stabilization, supports, and be able, hopefully be able to get them to be able to move back out into the community at that time. Uh, so that was my first experience. Thanks. So in the 1980s, we built um, two sets of guidelines, one for county residential ser county services and one for residential services. And those guidelines are both built on the same six benefits. We had two groups of people working toward the same uh, perspective. Um, the first thing that they decided was important was health and safety. And those measures are, um, those those two those benefits are measured in the guidelines. So if you want to see those guidelines, you can go to either our internet or internet, intranet website, and both sets of guidelines are um, on the internet and intranet. The second was personal power and choice. One of the interesting things about these guidelines is that they're, to some extent, in tension with each other. Because personal power and choice, we all know we can make choices that affect our health and safety. And so one of the things that's important for you as professionals in the field is to ensure that you maintain a healthy tension between those. Not, um, it is your responsibility to protect people's health and safety, but it's also your responsibility to, to ensure that they have a reasonable chance at exercising personal power and choice and not uh, restricting power and choice um, simply at your idea, but to take into account the person who relies on you for uh, help. The third was a, a sense of self-worth, um, a, a sense of status, a positive self-recognition, -re positive recognition by others, and we termed that status in the guidelines. The fourth was a range of experiences which help people participate in their community and that was given the term of integration but we what it means is we want people to participate in the social life in their community and that doesn't mean just presence in their community but it also means participation in their community because one can have a lot of presence without a lot of participation the fifth was re good relationships um, with friends and family and with you as a provider of service to them. And the sixth was the competence, the competence, uh, work competence, a management of their own affairs, competence, competence to the level that they can um, um, exercise. And it means capitalizing on whatever competencies the person has to have more control, more personal power and choice, more relationship, more, um, integration. So whatever competence the person can exercise, and that means if their competence is only a piece of their eye movement, that you capitalize on that and make sure people have a way of telling you what they need and ensuring that they have some control over their lives. In the 1990s, we used those six benefits and the measurement uh, that goes with them to build a set of quality guidelines for our service system. Uh, and we started to evaluate our service system on those quality guidelines. And the guidelines, as we began to train to them and influence how people thought about it, bring that perspective back again. How you think about people is really important because it influences what opportunities and experiences you give them. So that quality had, an, had a great impact on what uh, people had access to. And we trained professionals, we trained families, we trained self-advocates. And as a result of that, uh, county uh, service systems started thinking about, well, how can we organize families to be a more um, um, uh, beneficial uh, part of our uh, service system so their voice is heard both at the, prof at the system level with the department and at um, the local level with the county. And so counties organized parent coalitions 
across the state. And those parent coalitions have had a huge influence on what is available to people with developmental disabilities, what resources are available, and how we think about the system and what the system does for them. Self-advocates became a huge, also a huge important part of our system during the 80s and 90s and started to influence how we thought about it. Self-advocates demanding jobs and demanding homes, demanding real experiences in their lives. And in the 90s, we started to move toward full, full employment. And I'd like Shaw Seaman to tell you the story that he has uh, about employment. Sure. Um, my, one of my early experiences with people with developmental disabilities was in the early 90s, about 91, 92, I was a student at Central Washington University. And we had an individual that came to work for us in custodial. I was a custodial apprentice at the time in the custodial arts. <laughs> and uh, the supported employment individual's name was Doug. Now, our head custodian's name was also Doug, so we affectionately referred to uh, the supported employment individual was Doug Sr. since she was about 10 years older than, than the supervisor at the time. But I did have, I had some concerns um, when we first hi hired Doug at Central Washington because he was going to be responsible for gathering all the cardboard boxes throughout the facility, um, pulling them outside, using a box cutter, uh, just punching in and out, all these things. And we were, of course, responsible for making sure that he completed his tasks and did everything he needed to do. Doug was nonverbal, uh, he was autistic, and made limited eye contact, so communication I uh, had some concerns about as well. Well, Doug Sr. proved me wrong real quickly, uh, right out of the gates. He was showed how to punch in and punch out one time, and he had it from that point on. He was to work on time every day. He threw that box cutter around like it, there was no tomorrow, and never once had a mishap with it in the two or three years that I worked with him. So that was my first experience with supported employment for people with disabilities. So that brings us to the um, new century, the 21st century, uh, the decade of the 2000s. And our, the watchword or the theme for this um, uh, 10 years of, uh, from 2000 to 2010 is partnerships. Um, partnerships are very important to you as a professional because the Sometimes it's hard to understand um, what happens to your day from another person's perspective. So if you look in, if you work in residential services, the employment part of the person's day is really important. And sometimes those employment vendors don't understand your needs at all, and you can get sideways of them really quickly, and vice versa. So if you work in employment, those residential people don't understand your workday and can make it really miserable. If you're a case manager, everybody can make your life, life miserable. So it's uh, really important to, want, to think about partnerships and um, how, you th how you deliver the services that you do and who can help you do that. So if you're looking for partners, um, my suggestion to you is that you look for the people who can make you have a miserable day. And if the, those people are your partners, and if that's your client, then that's a really good partner to have. Um, what I about that relationship can be a partnership so that your day and his or her day can be better? What about a family who's giving you fits can be uh, better if you make them partners and what about a case man manager if you happen to be a family member watching this video what about a case manager can make your life a better day so just think about that as partnerships when I think about partnership as the division director I think about counties I think about residential providers I think about the legislature uh, I think about on my own administration all of those people can influence the services that I deliver, the kind of experiences that I have. So it's really important to understand what their role is in the process and capitalize on that and do my role to the very best ability that I can. In, in the 2009 critical audits shaped the future of the develop, Division of Developmental Disabilities. Uh, from, the, from those audits we received um, the direction 
and the resources to build a, an assessment system and to build a case management information system, which would give us access to the information that we have about people with developmental disabilities. In the field of developmental disabilities, we probably have the best information about all the individuals that we support. We've never had access to it till, uh, until now. Our new assessment system gives us access to describe the needs of people and be able to be clearer about what our decision-making process is and how we decide what services to offer and, uh, and which services are important, which services are best practice, which services uh, deliver what we need them to deliver. It's an opportunity to show the data that we have about people with developmental disabilities. Um, our vision for the future is to ensure that we continue this work, uh, that we create real lives for, for people with developmental disabilities, and that we build better partnership and we partnerships with people, particularly the people we just support, and that we remain constant in our values. And I would like to have um, Mike Rogers in this presentation because he's a partner along with the rest of us in, a, in this room. Um, in headquarters, he's one of the key ingredients of the um, headquarters staff because he makes sure that people who call us get to where they need to go. So, Michael, could you please describe the job that you have here? And also, um, we've given Michael a new um, responsibility that maybe you could um, uh, just describe, and then we'll end with that. And thank you very much, Michael. Um. Uh, I uh, answer the phones for the Department for the Division of Developmental Disabilities, and I transfer uh, them to uh, the pro proper proper people that they're assigned to, and uh, that's my uh, number one uh, assignment. Um, the other is, uh, assignment that I uh, have just got appointed by the governor to be of, uh, on the uh, Transportation Committee uh, for um, the governor, ACCT it's called. Uh, to recommend uh, guidelines for people for accessible transportation for people with special needs. And uh, that's my assignments.